name is Marla. Welcome to a Bible teaching, uh, kind of a different teaching today. Today I am going to teach about the end times. I just decided uh, with everything going on in the world with the COVID virus, I, just so many people questioning, is this the end of days? Is this the end of times? What are we looking for? I just decided I, I have to do teaching on it. And uh, quite honestly, I don't know where this teaching is going to go. I, I've written out a bunch of verses and what I think I'm going to do is I'm just going to talk about them as as I wrote them. And hopefully somehow it all makes sense to you uh, at the end. Because I really do want to encourage you. Um, that is biblical. Uh, yes, things are out of control. And, and where is God in all this? Uh, that's a major question for both believer and non-believer. But we are to be encouraged in this time because Bible prophecy is coming to light. Um, this is nothing we should be holding back on talking about. One third of your Bible is prophecy and God wants us to know exactly what is happening in the end times. Not that we are afraid, that we are encouraged. Um, I'm going to start off by reading you a, a passage of scripture which gives me the impetus to encourage you with these words that we're going to share today, however it looks. Um, you need to know why you can be encouraged even though the signs of the ends of the time yes they are starting to happen right no fear be encouraged first thessalonians 4 13 through 17. but we do not want you to be uninformed brothers about those who are asleep that you may not grieve as other others do who have no hope for since we believe that jesus died and rose again even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an arch archangel, and with the sound of a trumpet of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Well, what is so encouraging about this? The fact that we who are alive, when this happens, are going to be caught up to be with the Lord. Paul here is talking to the Thessalonian church they have questions. They are wondering. They have heard that Jesus Christ is coming back for all those people who believe in him. And they are worried and wondering what's going to happen to my dead mom, my dead father, my family, my friends who have died before me. What will happen to them? And Paul is saying, I want you to encourage one another with the words that when Jesus Christ comes to gather up his church, that the dead who have died first are going to be with the Lord. They're going to, their bodies are going to rise from the grave to meet their souls who are already with the Lord in the air. And then we who are alive are also going to be caught up to be with the Lord. This verse speaks about the rapture. The rapture of Jesus Christ's church. And when I say church, I don't mean any denomination. I mean the capital C church which Jesus Christ bought for himself when he died on the cross. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he created a, a family of believers. When he died, those people who believe in him by faith, who have asked the Lord to forgive them of their sins, who accept the, the salvation that he offered them on the cross by the, the wiping away of their sins and the, the, um, the fact that he died for them, they receive his Holy Spirit. And those people who have been born again of the Spirit of God are in his family, capital F family. They are considered his church. And this verse tells us that Jesus is coming to gather up his church to himself before the very end of days. The word up there, uh, the word in this verse, caught up, the English words caught up, are the Greek, is the Greek word harpazo, the Latin word raptura. That is the rapture verses in your in your Bible. Now, there are others, and we're going to talk about them, I guess. <laughs> we'll see. 
But this is something you can hang your hat on. There are people out there who don't want to talk about the rapture. It's controversial within church circles because some people believe that the rapture is going to happen before the tribulation, the end of end times when things get bad. Some people believe it's going to happen in the middle and some people believe it's going to happen at the end. Well, I am here to tell you that in my belief, because of this verse and other verses, the rapture of Jesus Christ Church happens before the tribulation when things get very bad because it's not an encouragement to me unless it happens before. <laughs> Paul here is saying encourage each other with these words. Well, it's not encouraging to me to hear that I'm going to go through the tribulation and then I'm going to be raptured or halfway through the tribulation I'm going to be raptured. That's not encouraging. What's encouraging is you're not going to go through this. All of our dead family and friends who, who were in Christ are going to be raised up before us and then we are going to go up and we are not going through the tribulation period of the earth. Now I will now define for you what the tribulation period of the earth is for those of you who don't know. There is coming in the end of times a very 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 bad time on the earth. It's called the tribulation. It's a seven year period of time which was predicted many times in the Bible where God is going to pour out his wrath on the earth. Um, this time period is meant for a time of final judgment for those people to finally see God as their God and turn to him. And hopefully they will have that chance during the tribulation. They will repent. They will believe in Jesus for their salvation. And they will also go to heaven. The, the tribulation period of the earth is a time period that specifically in the Bible is called the time of Jacob's trouble, which means that seven year period is a time meant for God to uh, pour out his wrath uh, specifically on the Jewish nation. Now, everybody who's left on the earth is going to be part of this wrath. But this end seven years is a specific time where God is finishing up completing what he started with his Jewish nation. God has chose the Jewish nation back in the time of Abraham. He started with an Abrahamic covenant given to Abraham, which said, you're going to be my chosen person, Abraham. Out of you, I'm going to have a nation. Your name is going to be great through that nation. I'm going to give you a promised land, and there's going to be a blessing coming out of your nation. Well, that blessing turns out to be the blessing of Jesus Christ, coming out of the Jewish line, the line of Abraham, to bless the whole world with salvation. But these promises to Abraham, the promises to the Jewish nation, continue on all the way through the Old Testament, all the way to the end of times. God is never going to turn back on his promises to the Jewish nation and his desire for them to follow him, see him, and be with him in heaven. The tribulation period is God's final plea to the Jewish nation. Please see me as God. Follow me. Come be with me in heaven. Let me give you your eternal promised land. If you read the Old Testament, you're going to see that this is God's plea to the Jewish nation over and over and over. I want you. Follow me. Be with me. I will give you things. Just be with me. Be with me. Be with me. And through the Old Testament, you will see constant rejection and then repentance and back again. The tribulation period is this final time where God comes and says, listen, I am, I am coming and I am going to make things bad and I want you to finally get it. I am your Lord. Uh, turn to me, plead and, and plead out to me and I will rescue you. So that is what the tribulation period is. It's a Jewish seven year wrath of God time. As I said, all the other people who are left on the earth, Gentiles, who were not raptured away, are going to go through that period with the Jewish nation. But that period is, it's a Jewish time period. And um, part of the reason that I know this is in the book of Daniel. If you look at Dan Daniel chapter 9, you're going to see a time period laid out called Daniel's 70 Weeks. It's all speaking to the Jewish nation, that the Jewish nation is going to have this whole time period of 69 weeks in which they are called to turn and, and, and follow the Lord. And then at the 69th week, 
the anointed one, the Messiah, is going to come. He's going to be cut off. And then after that, there's going to be a period of seven years left, the 70th week of Daniel left for God's tribulation period to, to come to the, the nation of Israel. There's a, there's a pause in there from the time of the anointed one being cut off, Jesus being cut off at the end of the 69th week to that 70th week, that seven year time period happening. We are in that pause period right now. This is the church age. When Jesus died, it started the age of the church. He started gathering in those people who believe in Jesus by faith into his family, the, the believing church. That is happening now. We are in the comma in Daniel's 70 weeks. But there's that seven, seven year period, the 70th week left to come for the Jewish nation. And this is another reason that I believe that the rapture of the church happens before the tribulation. Because everything you see in Daniel chapter 9, the 70 weeks, is to the Jewish, the Jewish people. It's, it's, it's a prophecy to the Jewish nation. And so... You'll see in there the 70th week of Daniel spelled out about the Antichrist coming and the abomination of desolation and all that happening. That's all talking about what's going to happen to the Jewish nation, not to the church. The church is not talked about in that, in that passage. So that's one of those other reasons I believe in the tribulation period happening after the rapture of God's church. And so I want you to be encouraged that though something is happening here and what's happening here on earth is clearly meant to be a sign for us to wake up and be alert as a church, um, we are not going into the tribulation. We will be raptured away as seen in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 17. We will not be here. So be encouraged that, um, yes, we need to be awake but we, we, we will not, we, we need to be awake to be ready, to be a pure and holy church. Now, I say that because um, that's something we should have been doing all along. And, you know, God puts up with a whole lot from his church. But as, as, as he's coming to, to take away the church, he is going to want to make sure that he's taking away only the true believers, only the people that truly have been born again who have been dwelling in his word, by his spirit, uh, doing his works by his spirit. And so he's asking people, I believe, during this time of quarantine, uh, asking his church, take a look. Have you had any idols that have been sitting on, on my throne? You know, where have you not been following me? You say you're a Christ follower. Have you been following me? Am I your number one? He's purifying his bride for the time when he comes for her. And I use that bride language because that's all over your Bible. That uh, Jesus is known as the groom and he has prepared a bride for himself. That's us, the church. And in your scriptures, you see that he's gone away to prepare a, a house for us for his bride. And this is all language of the Jewish wedding. Maybe you don't know about that, but... Um, I'll say it out loud, you know, Jesus is Jewish. I mean, he came as a as a Jewish baby and he grew up in a Jewish family and he continues to be Jewish today. And so it's no mistake that all within your Bible, there's all this language about the Jewish language, the, the Jesus being the bridegroom and him um, buying for himself or purchasing a bride when he died on the cross and him going away to prepare a room for his bride. This is what happens in the Jewish wedding. The bridegroom comes and asks uh, his, his wife-to-be to marry him. He, they're engaged. And he goes away to his father's home, and he builds a chamber, a wedding chamber for her. This is in the Jewish wedding. And he then, when the chamber is ready, he comes at a time unknown to the, to the bride-to-be, and he calls to her to come, and they go to the father's house, into the chamber, the wedding chamber. They consummate their marriage. They do that. Uh, and then there is a wedding feast. And so this also fits into this whole rapture language. This Jesus died on the cross. He's gone to his father's house to prepare a room for his bride. And he's going to come 
as we saw in the first Thessalonian verse, he's going to come with a trumpet and a shout from an archangel from the air, call his bride to himself and take her into the wedding chamber, which they would stay there for seven days. That's the seven years of the tribulation. And then there's going to be the wedding feast. So that is also more reason to believe that the rapture of the church is going to happen before the tribulation. It fits into the model that's all over your Bible about a bride and a bridegroom. All right. Now, let me just I'm going to start reading some of these verses and I'm going to flip around a bit and I'm going to explain them and I'm going to try to put them in context. I don't even know the order that I put them in, but I'm going to start reading and hopefully uh, you'll write some down and look them up and be encouraged by them. And, and just rest on the fact that you are not going to be in the tribulation, even though this is clearly a time that God is allowing his church to, to uh, quiet down, look within, stop the busyness, purify yourself, be ready. Um, you are not going to have to be ready for the tribulation. What you're going to have to be ready for is when he comes, that you want to be prepared the Bible says we should be looking up at all times. We're called to be looking for his imminent return. The rapture can happen at any time. Nothing has to happen before that. There's nothing that has to happen uh, scripturally for that to go on. There are lots of things that have to happen for the second coming of Christ, including the whole tribulation period. Um, that all has to happen. There's a lot of stuff in your Bible that says look for this and this and this for the actual day of the Lord to come. But you, as a Christ follower, you're not going to be on the earth to look for those things. <laughs> they are in your Bible. Um, there's going to be no surprise when, when the day of the Lord comes because it's going to come after seven years of literal hell on earth. But there is going to be a surprise as far as the rapture. Nobody knows when that's going to happen, not even Jesus. Um, that can come anytime. And so we're called to be looking up for the Lord. Are you, are you desiring him coming? I mean, I, I can tell you, um, you know, this, this pandemic thing certainly has made me a whole lot more, uh, ready for his return. You know, I, 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 I'll be the first to admit, you know, there are times that I'm like, gosh, you know, um, I love my house and I, you know, I love traveling. I love my dogs. Do I really want to be raptured? I mean, that's a terrible thing to say out loud, but it's true. I know many of you, you think, oh, you know, my family isn't saved yet and I don't want to go until they're saved or, you know, I want to see my child be married and, you know, I want to see all these things on the earth. Well, I'm here to tell you <laughs> that we should be looking up for the return of our Lord. It's We're called to do it in the scripture and we should also be doing it because what we have in store for us, waiting for us, being prepared now for 2,000 years uh, by Jesus is going to be amazing. I heard a pastor say once, just think about what God did in the six days of creation, how awesome the earth is. Jesus has been gone for 2,000 years preparing a room for you, bride. Can you imagine how glorious what is waiting for you is in heaven? And so we should all be looking up, waiting for the imminent return of Christ in the air to gather up his church to his side. All right, let's go to Luke 21, 36. And this is going to be an encouragement verse to stay awake. Uh, I'm going to start at 34. Luke 31, 34. Uh, Luke 21, 34. But watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down and dissipa uh, with dissipation and drunkenness and the cares of this life and that day come upon you suddenly like a trap for it is for it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the whole earth but stay awake at all times praying that you might have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and stand before the son of man these verses are a call to all of us to stay awake Many people, they say, well, I don't want to talk about the rapture and Jesus coming. You know, people have been saying for decades, he's going to return. He's going to return. You know, during the Holocaust, I'm sure people are saying, this is it. It's coming. You know, he's coming. He's coming. He didn't come then. The Bible uh, tells us to not be one of those people that says, oh, you know, he's, he's delayed. He's really not coming. And the Bible is fairly um, straightforward that that kind of thought process is going to lead you into false 
teaching that there are going to be false teachers that come that are going to say, I'm the Christ, follow me. They're even going to do miracles. And you are going to be deceived by that if you do not stand true to the word which says that he can come at any time and that time can be right now in these verses actually right before these verses it talks about the lesson of the fig, fig tree and staying awake by what you see in the lesson of the fig tree we have to be prepared because his return can be at any time we want to stay awake we want to be uh, busy doing the father's work here on earth many of us are out there trying to help others because of this pandemic good do it in the name of Jesus make sure you're telling people about Jesus Christ we are called to all tell people about how they can escape the wrath to come and be with the Lord in heaven upon their demise and now more than ever people are worried and they're afraid we're to be busy doing the father's work on earth um, because he Jesus can come at any time to rapture his church and we want to be raptured uh, while we're awake uh, lamps full of oil waiting for the Lord to come the lesson of the fig tree this is in uh, Luke 21 29 and he told them a parable look at the fig tree at all the, and all the trees as soon as they come out of belief you see for yourself and know that the summer is already near so also when you see these things taking place you know that the kingdom of God is near Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all this has taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. This is in the book of Luke. Uh, it is talking about the fact that there is going to be a generation that is raptured. And we sh will know who that generation is by looking at the lesson of the fig tree. Whenever you see the fig tree spoken about in scripture, it's talked about talking about the nation of Israel. This is saying that the nation of Israel has to be a nation of Israel for the rapture to happen. And there has to be, obviously be a church for the rapture to happen. Well, my friends, this is the time we're in. Learn the lesson of the fig tree. The generation that is alive when there is a nation of Israel and a church on the earth, that's the generation that is going to be raptured. I'm saying this slowly because you do realize that there was not a nation of Israel on the earth back in the early 1900s. The nation of Israel did not come together until 1948. There was no nation of Israel. The nation of Israel was, was dispersed all over the world. That happened back when the nation was clobbered by Babylon. This is back in the Old Testament. And it was kicked out of the promised land that was promised to Abraham and taken away into captivity by Babylon and then Persia. They were spread out all over the world. Even in the time of Jesus, you must know there was not a nation of Israel. Yes, there were some Jewish people living in Israel, but Rome had control of Israel. They didn't have their own um, laws. They were under the thumb of Rome. So... So it's an amazing thing when you think about it. Israel is the only nation that was a nation, then wasn't a nation, but still had people. There were people, but without a land. And then they became a nation again in a day. In fact, that's scriptural. I think I have that for you. Um, Isaiah, sorry, i got to find it. Isaiah 66, 8 is a prediction that the nation of Israel would come together in one day. Now, this is one of those ones that, boy, if you don't believe in the Bible being the Word of God, this will turn your, your mind around. Uh, Isaiah 66, 8 says, Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall a land be born in one day? Shall a nation be brought forth in a moment? For as soon as Zion was in labor, she brought forth her children. Well, hopefully you know, as far as history goes, that is what happened to the nation of Israel in 1948 after uh, the World War and everything that happened to the Jewish people. Uh, the nation of Israel was given to the Jewish people in one day by the stroke of a pen. I think it was Theodore Roosevelt. Sorry if I'm wrong about that. Maybe Eisenhower. Ah, I don't know. Anyway, somebody, one of our presidents said, Israel is going to have a land and it's going to be called Israel. That happened in one day's time. 
by the stroke of a pen. And that is predicted in your Bible. And that is what the lesson of the fig tree tells us, that the rapture is going to happen. The generation that is on earth, when Israel is a nation and there is a church, the, the rapture is going to happen out of that generation. And then you ask, well, what's a generation? So the, the generation that will be alive when the rapture happens. So a generation in your Bible, you can look for this. Just look for what the Bible says about a generation. There's two places, really. Generation is thought to be either 70 years or 80 years. Well, if you do the math on that, <laughs> then that comes to 2021. Now, I'm not date setting. I'm just telling you that the generation, that the time clock started on a generation in 1948, if you do the math on that, we're very close to the end of a generation that will see the rapture happen. So that's encouraging too, right? Maybe we are going to see the rapture happen in our lifetime. But meanwhile, we are supposed to be looking up. Um, okay, I'm going to go now into 1 Thessalonians 5. And we're going to read a little bit more about... Um, this idea of the church not going through the wrath of God. In 1 Thessalonians 5, you're going to see a whole lot of language about the day of the Lord. And it's going to talk about, um, while they're saying peace and security, the this wrath of God is going to start to happen. Well, a lot of people believe that that is going to happen when... Uh, this is when the Antichrist comes. At first, the Antichrist is going to come as somebody who is, is going to try to um, create peace. That's part of why the world is going to follow him. He's going to come having this solution to have peace and security for the whole world. And during that time, the temple, the third temple is going to be rebuilt in Israel. And um, if you look back at the Daniel chapter 9 verses you're going to see what happens that halfway through that seven year period of the tribulation everything is going to go wrong the antichrist is going to set himself up as a god in the middle of the temple and that starts the last three and a half years of the tribulation which is horrific these verses in first Thessal thessalonians 5 talk about that the day of the lord how when the Lord comes, it's going to be in the middle of when this time period is saying, oh, everything's going to be fine, peace and security. And then all of a sudden that abomination of desolation is going to happen and everything is going to go bad. But I want to read for you verse 9 in here, which says, um, For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's saying here uh, in the verse before, but since we belong we belong to the day. Let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and for the helmet of hope for salvation. And then it says, God has not destined us for wrath. It's talking about the church here. And it's, you know, you can read that in, in the context and say, well, it's talking about the fact that we weren't destined for the wrath of God because Jesus took it on the cross. It is saying that, but it's also saying we're not destined for the wrath of God. The wrath of God is not going to be on his church. That time period, the tribulation, which is the which is God's wrath poured out on the earth as it's his final time to try to get people to turn and repent, repent. The wrath of God is not meant for the church. More support of the rapture of the church right there. Matthew 25. Um, let's just turn to Matthew 25 and we can look a little bit about being ready verses. All right. This is the um the virgins and their lamps. We want to be ready. So Matthew 25, uh, starting with verse 1, talks about the parable of the ten virgins. And it's talking about uh, five virgins of being foolish and not having uh, oil ready in their lamps. And then the bridegroom coming and them scrambling for oil. There's another five virgins who have oil and they're ready and prepared. And this all talks about what we were talking about before, the bridegroom coming for the bride. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil in their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, that's the delay that we're going through now, right? 2,000 year delay. But at midnight, there was a cry, rapture verse. 
Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the, and the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered saying, since there will not be enough for all of us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourself. And while they were going out to buy, the bridegroom came for those who were ready, uh, went, went with into him to the marriage feast and the door was shut. Afterwards, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Okay, we are to be busy doing our father's work and we are to be busy waiting for the bridegroom to come, ready for him to come. These other virgins, they thought they were going to be fine. They were saying they were Christians. We're fine. We're Christians. We're fine. But meanwhile, they were not living, following the Lord. They were hi hypocritical. They were, um, you know, they were saying they were Christians with their mouth, but they weren't all in Christ's followers. They weren't studying their word, the, the word of God. They weren't doing the Father's work. They weren't telling other people about Jesus. They weren't um, following and obeying his commands. They were Christians by by their lips but they weren't christians by their action and god says that the fruit of a believer is what shows if they are an all in christ follower or not and that fruit looks like the fruit of love you know are you are you doing good works that's not what gets you saved doing work for the lord is a outflowing of being saved because we love him we go and we do good things and we try to point people to him that's the biggest thing jesus came to have people know that there was a kingdom of god that they could be included in he didn't come to do good work on the planet he did those miracles and taught about you know how to be forgiving and all that as a way of pointing people to the kingdom of god he, jesus came to be a savior this world is passing away. <laughs> when you read more and more about the end times, the tribulation, you are going to see it's not about this earth. It's about heaven and getting there. And so all of this end time stuff, all the preparation that you're feeling, like the stirring in your heart, you know, is what is going on? That's turning your eyes upward. Look for him. Look for the rapture. We're called to do it. Okay, moving along. I want to go now to Philippians 3.20, and let's just see what that says. Like I said, I have this is all out of order. I don't even know the order I put these in. I just know I, I wrote out verses, and I thought, I'm going to talk about this, and this could go on for an hour. I have no idea. But hopefully you'll stay with me, and it's interesting to you, um, because it's it's not teaching that we get too much of, and, and I don't want to I don't want to neglect teaching about it. Um, just by my own conviction, I, you know, I feel um, God has given me, I guess, a, a teaching spirit and, um, you know, not that it means anything, but I went to seminary, so I've had some amazing teachers and I just feel like I want to share, you know, what the Lord has taught me. So Philippians 3.20 says but our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a savior the lord jesus christ who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself that verse means that we will have a glorified body we um we will be transformed these shells that are dying whether a virus or hit by a car the, these bodies, as an all-in Christ follower, when you die, your body is going to be buried or cremated or whatever. But at a certain point, hopefully it will be at the rapture, which happens now. Um, we will have a glorified, transformed body. We are going to be just like Jesus um, at, at, at some day. Our citizenship is in heaven. We are not meant to be on this earth. Any kind of that weird feeling that you have and you're like, I don't belong here and what is going on and I don't even want to be here anymore. Your citizenship is in heaven if you're an all-in Christ follower. And so that's a very normal feeling to have. I would have it too. I mean, I do have it. So I hope you have it. All right. Um, let's go into the Old Testament. Isaiah 26, 19. And we'll just see how this all fits into everything. 
Um, I believe that this is more rapture verse. Uh, Isaiah 26, 19 says, For um, your dead shall live, their bodies shall rise. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy. For your dew is a dew of light, and the earth will give birth to the dead. There you go. That is talking about the resurrection of your lowly body. Your body is going to rise. Those who dwell in the dust are going to awake and sing for joy. Can you believe it? In your Old Testament on Isaiah, it talks about resurrection. The bodies of his, those who believe being resurrected. Um, the earth is going to give birth to its dead. And that goes back to that first chapter. I mean, those first verses I, I read. Encourage one another. All the people that you know who have died, who are in Christ, they, their bodies are going to come out of the earth and join their soul together in the air. And the same is going to happen for us if we die too. We are going to have a resurrected body at the coming of Jesus when he comes to rapture his church. It's happening. Titus 2, 3. Well, this is going to give you more encouragement and this is a this is a charge to you Titus 2 3 says <clears throat> uh, well let's go before that Titus 2 11 for for the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled upright and godly lives in the present age waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for, for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. There it is. We have a blessed hope. Are you living an up, upright, self-controlled life? Are you, are you doing all the things that you said you would do as far as obedience to the Lord when you said that he was your Lord and Savior? Because he purified for himself a people when he died on that cross. And you're, you're that person if you say you're an all-in Christ follower. And that's who he's coming for. The born-again, all-in, purified bride, bride of Christ. Is that you? I hope so. That's who he's coming for. It's our blessed hope. Um... 2 Peter 2 9. Let's see what this one says. 2 Peter 2 9. Uh, actually, I think we're going to read 4 through 9. 2 Peter 4 through 9. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to, to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, if he rescued the righteous lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds, for he saw and he heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling pa passion and despise authority. That is hope versus it's saying here just like god rescued noah from the ungodliness of the world and lot who was in the middle of gomorrah which was awful so will the lord rescue those people who believe in him who are righteous because jesus christ has made them righteous the lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials that's a rapture verse God is not going to let us go through the tribulation. The Lord knows how to rescue the righteous. He did it with Noah. He did it with Lot. He's going to do it with his church. We are only righteous because Jesus Christ makes us righteous. Don't be fooled. You're not righteous by your good works. You're righteous because Jesus Christ died on the cross and wiped you clean of your sins. You can only stand in front of a holy God and say, I'm righteous. If you say, I'm only righteous because I believe in Jesus, and that's it. Nothing else makes you righteous in the sight of God. And nothing else will get you saved from the tribulation except your belief in Jesus and being righteous by what he did on the cross for on your behalf. Okay, let's do 
John 14, 1 through 3, I think that these are the verses that talk about God going to prepare a room for us. So um, I wasn't talking out of turn when I told you that the Bible said that he's going to make a room for us. Let's see if I'm right. John 14, 1 through 3 says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? That I is Jesus. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may also shall be. Rapture verse, God is, Jesus is coming to take us to the room he's prepared for us that is going to happen and now first john 3 2 through 3 first john 3 2 through 3 says <clears throat> beloved we are god's children now and what we know uh, and what we will oh sorry let me start again Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him like he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. That's a rapture verse. We are When he appears to rapture us, we are going to be like him in a, in a twinkling of an eye, in our glorified body. Everybody who hopes in him, are you purifying yourself? Are you looking at yourself right now and saying, why has God given me this time period to check in, to quiet down, to make sure that I'm being obedient, that I don't have any idols? An idol is, you know, is your, is your, have your kids been your idol? Has everything you've worried about been about your kids? Have, have you been running your life based on how they want your life to be? Your, your partner, your spouse, is, is that person an idol? Because God wouldn't want you running after that person like they are a God. How about your dogs? I have three. They run me ragged and I do all kinds of things just because of them. Are they an idol to me? Sometimes, absolutely. I have got to wrestle with that. Um, how about your comfort? Your comfort, you're being able to drive and go for a walk or, or go to a state park or, or, or go on vacation. Has that been an idol for you? How about your bank account? Has that been an idol? Have you been resting on the fact that all of what you have in your bank is going to carry you through? Well, that's an idol. you got to purify yourself of thinking that that stuff is what you need to trust in because you don't need to trust in that. You need to trust in the Lord and he's coming for you and he wants you to be purified when he gets here, okay? Um, here we go. Romans 13. Let's see what Romans 13 has for us. Romans 13, 11 through 12 says, Besides this you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. We are a whole lot closer to Jesus coming for his church than we were yesterday. And before that, the day before that, and the day before that, we're called to continue to look for him and to continue being light. Let our works be of the light and let us continue to tell people, hey, you know, I'm delivering this meal because God saved me. Jesus is my Lord and I know he gave himself and so I'm putting myself at harm's way right now to deliver this meal to you because I, I want to love you like Jesus loved me. All right, you want to do good works in this time? Absolutely. But you want to make sure that you're connecting your good works to Jesus. Because let me tell you, there's all kinds of people out there doing good work. There are great Buddhists out there, and there are great Jewish people, and there's great Muslim people out there too. But our call as Christ followers is to tell them why we're doing good works. What compels you to love others in this time? What compels you to give of your time and your money and your health? What? I hope it's Jesus because he did it for you. So you got to tell them. You got to connect the two dots. All right. First uh, Corinthians 15. Let's see what that one says. First Corinthians 15, 50 through 54. That's a long chapter, right? <clears throat> I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the 
imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed for this perishable body must be but must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on the an immortality when the perishable puts on the imperishable then the more and the mortal puts on immortality then shall come to pass the saying written death is swallowed up in victory oh death where is your victory oh death where is your sting yes indeed rapture verse twinkling of an eye this perishable body this flesh that's wearing away wrinkles and gray hair growing in and all that it's all going to go in a twinkling of an eye when he comes for his church in a rapture in the rapture in the twinkling of an eye we are all going to get this imperishable glorified body that's going to live on eternally in heaven if you are in the body of christ if you are at all in christ follower that is a promise to you right there in first corinthians uh, 15 50 and forward okay when we uh the next thing that we see uh <laughs> um i'm gonna skip <laughs> because i already talked about daniel and and i do want you to go into those daniel verses go into daniel 9 verses 24 through 27 and read about the 70 weeks as you get to the end of there, you're going to read about the, the 70th week, the tribulation, which we are not going through, and you're going to you're going to get some information about what happens with the Antichrist. And um, it may be, you know what, if you want a video on the tribulation and the Antichrist and the Mark of the Beast and all that, I can do that. This is getting really long, so I'm not going to do that here, but I can do that if you want. You can just let me know. Write me at in, info at injesusname.net or put a comment in the YouTube and and I'll do a video on the tribulation if you want. Um, all right. We did these already, which is good. We did Thessalonians. Good. We talked about Noah and all that. Okay. How about Matthew 13, 36 through 43? <clears throat> this is talking about the tares and the wheat. And um, this verse should be a little upsetting um, if you read it. Let me see if I got it marked. Matthew 13. I didn't. Okay, let's see here. Matthew 13, 36 through 43 says, The parable of the weeds explained. Then he left the crowds and went into a house, and his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man, the, the field is the world, and the good seeds is the son of the kingdom. The weeds are the son of the evil one, and, and the enemy has sown them, and the enemy who has sown them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace in that place there will be weeping and gnashes of gnashing of tree, teeth then the righteous will shine like the sun and the kingdom is their, of their father he who has ears let them hear that's talking about the fact that right among us there are people who who um who think that they're going to be in the kingdom of god they, they might be saying you know well, i'm a christian and they're they're um they're right in the same field as us, and uh, God says, nope, they're, he's, he's allowing some of the false teachers uh, that are out there to grow up right among us. Some people are, are teaching some really false stuff right now, and, um, and you have to be aware, if you're an all-in-Christ follower, of what you are following. And so this is saying, in the end, God knows who's who, and he's going to let those things grow up right among us. So you have to be grounded in the word. Make sure you know this word backwards and forwards so you don't go after false teachers. That's all over your New Testament. Beware of false teaching. Beware of false teaching. There's going to be ones that come at the end of the age saying, I'm Jesus, and I'm doing these miracles. Don't you follow. You know what your Bible says about Jesus. He's coming in the rapture. The next thing that Jesus is going to do is rapture his church. That's it. He's not coming again and doing some miracles. That's not happening, all right? So be careful. Be very careful. 
Oh, sorry, the dogs are going to start. It's bound to happen. <clears throat> uh, Matthew 24 talks about the beginning of birth pains. I want you to read those verses because clearly we are in the beginning of birth pains. All right, When you see pestilence all over the globe and earthquakes all over and wars and all that, birth pains, right? People who get, who have given birth, they know what this feels like. It's like it feels like something is happening before the something happens. So, yes, this kind of a global pandemic is surely the birth pains, but the church is not going to be in the actual birth. <laughs> right? It's not going to be in the in the painful part, all right? This is just the 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 revving up. I want to leave you I think with one one last thing, and it's it's in the book of Revelation, and this is, I think, you know, sometimes people just steer away from talking about the book of Revelation, but, but there is something that you need to know about the book of Revelation um, that supports these rapture verses. Um, you don't, you see in, in the first three chapters of the book of Revelation, the church is talked about lots, but after, in chapter four and forward, you don't hear one more peep about the church. In chapter, in the earlier chapters, you're going to see that there are there are um, seven letters to seven churches. This starts in chapter two of Revelation and it ends at the end of chapter three. So, these seven letters to the seven churches are all letters which are um, giving us snapshots of the churches through the ages, and there these are letters from Jesus to the churches. All right, and John is talking about them after. Chapter 3, no more church in the whole book of Revelation at all, except when you see John going up to heaven, and there he sees 24 elders, which are representatives of the church. I'm telling you this to say two things. Number one, all of what happens in Revelation is a snapshot of the rapture, that church, church, church talk, and then after the end of chapter 3, you see John called up to heaven, He's a representative of the church. Obviously, God is uh, John is a born-again believer. He is called up, caught up to heaven, and when he gets there, the 24 elders, which are representatives of the church, are already there. So how did the church get into heaven if they weren't raptured? Aside from that, you're going to see the very last letter to the church, churches, is the church of Laodicea. And if you read... Everything about the church of Laodicea, you're going to see that that church was lukewarm. They were neither hot nor they were cold. They were a church and they were doing church things, but they weren't on fire for the Lord, nor were they completely dead. They were just in the middle, lukewarm. And Jesus leaves that church letter as the last letter, the last representative church on earth, before the rapture, as you see in verse, in chapter 4. I'm saying this to tell you that I believe that we are in this Church of Laodicea age. The churches around have become lukewarm. They're doing great programming and lovely entertaining services and lots of great music, but they are not boldly proclaiming the truth of Jesus. They're not telling about his suffering, death on the cross, and how to get into heaven, and the fact that you will go to hell if you don't believe in him. They're not on fire for the Lord. They're not telling people about the end days. They're refusing to teach about Revelation and the rapture and all of this stuff because it's controversial and because they don't want to ruffle people's feathers. They'd rather do fluffy, uh, ear-tickling teaching. I think this church of Laodicea is the church age that we're in now, the lukewarm church. And I do believe that what we're going through now, as far as what's happening with this plague and people not being able to go to church, is God is cutting away the distractions, cutting away the fluff, the entertainment, bringing the church into the homes like he birthed the church in homes and he's allowing people to take the time to purify themselves to see what's really important to take the idol of their capital of their little c church building off the table this is not about a building this is about him and i believe that god is doing something big by taking us out of our buildings and allowing us this time to purify ourselves and make us drive us towards being 
hot. <laughs> we want to be on fire, all in, born again, Bible-believing churches that talk about the fact that Jesus is coming and we are supposed to be looking for him. We are called to be looking up and waiting for his imminent return to rapture his bride. And we are called to tell people this as an encouragement. Encourage them. They don't have to go through what is clearly going to be worse on this earth. It's all out there. Um, prophecy all over your Bible about the end of times when the wrath of God is going to be poured out on the earth. Clearly in the book of Revelation, you can read it, it gets awful. It's going to be terrible. What we're having right here is just a little bit of a taste of the birth pains. It's nothing compared to what is coming. And so yes, we are called to be on fire and hot, telling people that they can escape the wrath of God through their trust in Jesus Christ, who took the wrath of God when he went to the cross, so that you never have to take the wrath of, the God, of God on you at the end of days, in the tribulation, form of the tribulation, or at the end of your day, if you die before the Lord comes. You will never, ever suffer the wrath of God if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you obey him as you, you, you declared him your Lord, you're going to take that Bible, you're going to read it, and you're going to obey. Purify yourself because he's coming. He's coming soon. This is all birth pains getting ready for his imminent return. It can happen at any time. Okay, I, I really hope this is long. It's an hour worth of teaching. I know I threw a lot at you and there's so much more I can talk about. But I think I'll just end it there and just, you know, read in Revelation, uh, the trumpet blast, John being called up. That's a snapshot of the rapture that is coming. Um, there is going to be a trumpet blast. There's going to be a shout of the archangel. The Lord is coming to rapture his church. Be encouraged. The end of time is coming, but if you are in the body of Christ, part of his church, you are not going through the tribulation. All right? He's coming for you, his bride. He's preparing a room for you. Get ready. All right? We'll see you next time. Bye now.